Welcome back. Last time we looked at how to set up a connection with the design server so we can get started working with Cadence. In this video, we'll take our first steps at working with Cadence by looking at the library manager and we're also going to discuss a little bit what we're going to design over the next couple of videos. Let's first open an X2Go connection like we did last time. That will give us the desktop that looks something like this. Now, because we are going to work with FreePDK, we naturally have to click on the shortcut that says Cadence Virtuoso FreePDK 45. That will open up two windows. This window is called the log and it contains all kinds of information on what Cadence is currently doing. Think of it as a, a trail of breadcrumbs. It always tells you what Cadence is up to. It also contains errors if something goes wrong. So if Cadence is doing something that you don't immediately understand, just take a look at the log and usually you can spot the error in there. The other window is called the library manager and it may or may not show up automatically. If it doesn't, you can always open it by going to the top bar menu of the log window and clicking on tools and then library manager. In the leftmost column of the library manager, you can see all of the libraries that we have access to. A library is a group of components or circuits that are collected by a designer and we already have access to many of them. One of them is the analog lib library, which contains many idealized components. Think of resistors, capacitors, voltage sources, current sources, and the list goes on and on, more than I can discuss in a brief video like this. So I would personally recommend, take a look at the circuits that you can find in this library. Just click on the library and you will find the relevant components in the middle column. Naturally, there is also a library that contains the components for FreePDK. We can find those in the library called NCSU Devices FreePDK45. And in there, you will find eight different transistor models, four of which are used for PMOS transistors and four of which are for NMOS transistors. And for both categories, we have a VTL, VTH and VTG models, which stand for low, high and nominal threshold voltage transistors respectively. We also have a VTH KOX model, which refers to a thick oxide transistor. These transistors have, as their name implies, a very thick gate oxide, and as a result can sustain much larger voltages across the terminals than a usual thin oxide transistor, like the VTR and VTH models that we just discussed. For our own designs that we're going to make in this video series, I would recommend setting up our own library. So let's do that. Go to the top bar menu and click File, New, Library, and then we can use this window to set a nice name for the library. Now, in that particular case, let's call it something like ADV CMOS. Click on OK, and then we'll be asked to relate it in a certain way to a technology library. Now, what we mean by that is we want to relate it to a certain PDK. In our particular case, it would be free PDK 45. So we do that by choosing the attach to an existing technology library uh, option, clicking on OK, and then choosing NCSU TechLib FreePDK45. Once you've done that, we have our own library in the leftmost column of the library manager. Great, so now we have our own library. In the next video, we're going to set up our first circuit in this library. But before we do that, I think it's important that we also discuss how we're going to design those circuits. You see, a structured approach to designing circuits in Cadence can genuinely help you down the line. In this video series, we're just going to stick to a simple CMOS inverter. That is a circuit that's made of a PMOS transistor and an MOS transistor stacked up on top of each other. And what it effectively does is it takes in some digital logic level on the input and outputs the opposite level. So if we place VDD, the supply voltage on the input, we'll get the ground level at the output and vice versa. But these two components will not nearly be enough to run the entire simulation. We need a supply to pla placed at the top of the PMOS transistor. We need a ground node beneath the MOS transistor. We need some input voltage source at the input, and we might want some output load at the output, like a capacitor or a resistor. All of these components will usually come from the analog lib library, which, as we just mentioned, contains only idealized components. Now, for simple components like resistors and capacitors, that isn't that much of a problem. 
But voltage sources and current sources are completely fictional components. There is no way we can make those in practice. This isn't really a problem for a circuit this small. But let's imagine that five years down the line, you're working at a company making a very big, complicated integrated circuit. And right in the last week before sending the files to the factory, you find out that in one of the circuits, there is still one little idealized component, a current source, stuck somewhere. You will have to replace that at the very last minute, meaning that you won't have the time to adequately test your circuit under all conditions anymore. That will be a genuine nightmare. So in your designs, you should adopt a structured approach that allows you to prevent these kinds of errors from happening. And the approach that we're going to use is called modular circuit design. What that means is that for the transistor circuits that we have, iron inverter, we're going to designate the inputs and outputs, in this case, literally the input and output of the transistor, but also the supply node and the ground node. We're going to put the entire circuit in a little box with those inputs and outputs. We're then going to create a second schematic where we can use all the idealized components that we want and the transistor level circuits as black boxes like this. Now working like this, we know 100% for certain that there are no ideal components inside those black boxes, meaning that it is a manufacturable circuit. I can completely understand if you might think now that this is a bit convoluted for a two transistor circuit, but this really pays off once your circuits start scaling. But there are also other reasons why you might want to do this. Let's say you want to make a triple inverter, which is literally what its name implies. It's three inverters in series after each other. Instead of having to place six transistors in a schematic, each with their own parameters, we can now also create a test bench with three of these black boxes hooked up to each other. And if we want to change the parameters of all of these inverters at once, we can just change the base schematic for the inverter, and thus all three inverters in the chain are updated. In other words, by using a modular approach like this, you can save yourself a lot of manual work, which is also usually quite error prone. That concludes our discussion of the library manager and the approach we're going to use to design the inverter over the next few videos.